Good morning. Let's begin. Unix time, 154-230-0000. On this date, the Bitcoin Cash Network will undergo a scheduled protocol upgrade. On this day, a war will begin. A war for the future of Bitcoin and the viability of blockchain. This day is today. The title of my talk is Battle of the Hash. Its purpose to make you rethink what you think you understand about the security of blockchains. We don't know if blockchains work. That may sound odd considering that this conference is largely dedicated to them, but it's true. And it's true because blockchains have yet to be shown robust in adversarial scenarios. And it's critical that blockchains are robust to adversaries because they're permissionless, decentralized. There's no central group in control who can fix things should they break. Satoshi Nakamoto recognized that Bitcoin was vulnerable. On the first page of the Bitcoin white paper, he writes, the system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. Let that sink in for a minute. It means that Bitcoin or blockchains in general have a security model that relies on the majority being honest. If the majority is not honest, the system is not secure. Bitcoin was designed with the assumption that the majority would be honest. And we know that Satoshi believed that was a reasonable assumption that would hold. In section six, he writes, if a greedy attacker is able to assemble more CPU power than all the honest nodes, he would have to choose between using it to defraud people by stealing back his payments or using it to generate new coins. He ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules, such rules that favor him with more new coins than everyone else combined than to undermine the system and the validity of his own wealth. That all sounds reasonable, but it's not necessarily true. The point I want to drive home is that blockchain security comes from economic incentives, not from math. We sort of cross our fingers and hope that the participants in these decentralized system we're building behave the way we want them to behave. But that's not guaranteed. What if they don't play by the rules? I said that a war will begin today, so let's meet the initiators of the war. Funding the initiative, we have billionaire Calvin Ayer, who earned his fortune in the online gambling world. Leading the initiative, we have Craig Wright, who some people believe is Satoshi Nakamoto, the mysterious creator of Bitcoin, while other people think he's a madman. Providing technical support, we have genius hacker Gregory Maxwell, who's infamous for popping a bottle of champagne to celebrate the fact that they'd driven transaction fees on the Bitcoin Core Network over $50 per payment. In total, we estimate that this group controls three exahashes of mining power. And they're angry. We will mine until others stop. We have 51%. 51% means sustained hash over years. Short-termers mine on our side or earn nothing for years. We win or go down with the ship. This isn't a game. This is war fought not with guns, but with computers instead. Now I want to visualize the power of three exahash. Exa is the SI prefix for 1,000 to the power of six. So three exa is this number here. A hash is one attempt to solve the Bitcoin block puzzle and, and mine a new block. So three exahash means that these attackers can make this many attempts at solving the next block every second. To match that with regular computers would take a trillion. Even if we were somehow to aim 
all of the computers on Earth at the Bitcoin Cash network, it would amount to less than a percent of the hash power controlled by these attackers. The reality is that Bitcoin mining is professionalized. It is, takes place in warehouses like this full of hundreds and thousands of specialized Bitcoin mining computer infrastructure. To get a sense of scale, this is a forklift. The attackers control hundreds of thousands of specialized mining machines deployed in warehouses like this across the globe. In terms of raw power, three exahashes is about 400 megawatts, which is roughly equivalent to the average power generation from the hydroelectric generation generating station on the Hoover Dam in the US. In terms of energy, it represents one Hiroshima-sized nuclear bomb being released every two days. The cost, a million dollars per day. Does this group have majority hash power? When I created a slide yesterday, it appeared they did. It appeared that they had about 75% of the Bitcoin Cash hash power. With that, they can perform what's called the 51% attack. So on this slide, I want to explain how a 51% attack works. In peacetime, Bitcoin miners are always mining on the most recent block. And what happens is the blocks extend in the linear chain, which we call the blockchain. If there is a 51% attack, things look different. I'm going to use green to indicate the honest miners and red to indicate the attackers. So let's imagine that the honest miners find this block here. Now, the attackers, instead of mining a new block on top of this green block, they're going to start trying to mine a block uh, on the previous one. Eventually, they'll find it, but they'll keep that hidden. The honest miners continue to mine, and maybe they find another block. But because the attackers control more total hash power than all the honest miners combined, it's mathematically guaranteed that the red chain eventually grows longer than the green chain. When that happens, the attackers can publish their attack chain. The rest of the network now sees this red chain as the longest chain. They think, oops, I was mining on the wrong chain, and they drop or orphan those two green blocks and begin trying to mine again here. The consequence is the miners who are honest, who found those two green blocks, they lose the 12.5 bitcoins that they would have normally received. So they don't like that. Mining continues. And let's imagine that an honest miner finds this block here. Again, the attackers can route around him and cause his block to be orphaned and his reward to be lost. I hope this diagram makes it clear that if an attacker controls the majority of the hash power, he can mine 100% of the blocks. What can he do with such an attack? Well, the most famous example is double spend. So the idea here is that the attacker would send, say, a million dollars in Bitcoin cash to a cryptocurrency exchange, trade that for Ethereum, withdraw the Ethereum, and then release this attack chain, which reverses the transaction where he sent the Bitcoin cash to the exchange in the first place. The end result is that the attacker keeps the Ethereum, but he keeps his Bitcoin cash too, because the transaction that he used to pay the exchange is no longer part of the blockchain. I don't think we'll see this type of an attack starting today and next week, because it's blatantly criminal. Another thing an attacker can do is censor transactions. Miners can choose which transactions go into their block. For example, miners can make their blocks contain no transaction at all, mine empty blocks. This isn't a problem normally because eventually some other miner will mine a block that clears the backlog of transactions. But in a 51% attack scenario, the Attackers, because they're guaranteed to be able to mine every block, they can guarantee that every block is empty and then effectively grind economic activity on that chain to a halt. 
This, I think, is the most affecting and interesting. They can also affect the rules. I said at the beginning that there was going to be a protocol upgrade, and that protocol upgrade was going to cause a war. And the war is really related to that protocol upgrade. So there are certain changes that the green side wants to make that the red side doesn't like. So what they can do with 51% is they can continue to mine normally, confirming everybody's transactions. Users don't see anything going wrong. But if one of the honest miners mines a green block here that contains these new protocol changes they don't like, well, they can orphan it using the attack. So this puts financial pressure on those green miners to you know, maybe give up trying to activate this protocol change and return to mining the way the red miners want them to. Okay, so I painted a grim picture of the green team, but what's not shown in this picture is the huge pool of hash rate controlled by miners mining on the BTC blockchain. So it wouldn't surprise me if shortly before the protocol upgrade begins, a few hours from now, if we see migration of hash power to the Bitcoin Cash network to tilt the playing field in favor of the green team. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this slide. And I'm gonna end on the question, how do you discern an attacker from a defender? The talk I gave was biased. I gave it from the perspective of someone who really believed that this protocol that's scheduled to happen today was a good thing. I called myself honest. I called them attackers. I used green to indicate my color. I colored them red. I called them dishonest. I showed pictures of them drinking alcohol and smoking cigars. I showed tweets where they said nasty things. I created a narrative which made it seem like I'm the good guy and they're the bad guy. But I think I could give this talk from the opposite perspective. I could say that I'm the attacker. I'm the one trying to change the protocol. And the people I was calling attackers, no, they're the defenders. They're trying to fight this protocol change which they see as destructive to the future of Bitcoin Cash. So I don't have a good answer for how to discern an attacker from a defender. There is a saying that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and I think that's apt in the world of blockchains. Looks like my time is up, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you again. Um, any questions? We have time for just one question. Please. Sorry, I'm always interrupting, but I'm very curious. It's a very interesting uh, conference, and I would like to, find, to ask how many transactions per minute can actually uh, uh, done with a Bitcoin, for instance, if somebody wants to sell some bit, Bitcoin, and they want to sell tomorrow a Bitcoin, and uh, the price is 6,000 or 20,000, whatever, how fast is that transaction if I want to sell it in, in an hour, for instance? through all this uh, blockchain networking, because it becomes very complicated. I'm very curious, because yeah. I don't understand very well, well that. Yeah, so Maybe that, I'm ignorant. Right, so that's the idea of this, this scaling debate, scaling decentralized blockchains. And Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin BTC, right now is limited to about three transactions per second, so three times 3,600 gives you your answer per hours. But that's limited by protocol rules, not by the technology itself. So there was another battle about a year ago that resulted in a split of the Bitcoin blockchain into Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core. So on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, we can produce, you know, process like 100 transactions per second easily. And it seems, based on the research we've done, that there's no reason we can't scale Bitcoin as designed by Satoshi Nakamoto to a global payment system that can process 50,000, 100,000 transactions per second. I have, I, I'm a physicist by, by training. I see no physical or technological reason why Bitcoin, as designed, can't scale to a global system used by all humans on the planet. Okay. okay. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.